protein production strategies, right? So we've covered useful, ba which bacteria to use, right? Um, protein production in bacteria, including useful bacterial vectors, how those, and, and, and expression vectors, We've looked at inducible expression driven by a couple of different types of promoters, sort of simple um, on-off switches like, like, uh, the, the lactose op, like, like the lactose promoter and the arabinose promoter, um, and then more complicated uh, protein production systems, which can give you much, much higher levels of protein production and, and, are, and are basically on-off switches, um, like, like the T7 driven protein production. Um, We've looked at optimizing translation. That includes things like rare codons, ribosomes binding sites, um, secondary structure of mRNAs and, th and, and the second codon and things like this. Um, and this time, we're going to, we're going to move, move on a little bit. Um, because part of producing the protein, it, it's fine. Essentially, central dogma brings you from DNA to a big polypeptide, but it doesn't actually give you, necessarily give you a functional protein. Um, so, there, so there might be further steps beyond actually making the, the polypeptide that, that to, to get a functional protein. So, so the next bit, um, I was told by a friend um, at New England Biolabs that the next frontier in sort of um, in biotech in terms of helping people to, to make more protein is, is really protein folding. Um, and, it, and it's much more complicated. Um, Good. So protein folding in, in, in encompasses sort of the very simple task of going from a polypeptide to a folded protein, and that's sort of biophysics. I want to sort of just cover the background for the biophysics because for me it always helps. To, if I understand in a theoretical sort of way how this stuff happens, I can, I can go back and try to troubleshoot it um, just by tweaking little things about the, the thing if I understand the principles. Um, and then we'll talk about post-translational modification and protein localization and how those can be important for, for getting functional protein. Um, depending on where we are, we might break there. because So this session today is split up into two sessions, one in the morning, one in the, the afternoon. And confusingly, they put it in two different lecture theaters. So good luck. Uh, um, and uh, I don't know whether we'll make it all the way through all of the, the post-translational modifications and, and protein localization before we get to production. It, my, my goal is to make it through all of that before we get to protein production um, in eukaryotic microorganisms. Um, and again, we'll, we'll run through the same thing. We'll talk about useful species. We'll talk about standard expression, uh, expression vectors and inducible expression. So this is what we talked about last time, and this time we're going to talk about uh, problems with protein folding. And there are two main problems with protein folding. The, the first is that your protein can get degraded by proteases. That's when you, when you know that you've got good production of your, of your polypeptide. You know that you're getting good transcription of it. You can see that it's being translated, but nonetheless, you still don't get any protein, right? And you prep your protein, and in, in the initial stages, you can see protein there when you, when you lyse your cells. But by the time you get purified protein, it's, it's fragmented into bits, and most of it's gone. Um, the other thing that can happen, which we'll probably actually talk about first, is, is that you can get protein aggregates in the forms of inclusion bodies and then just uh, and, and other sorts of, of aggregated protein. And most of the time, protein aggregates aren't, aren't functional. They, they, they can be a useful tool for protein purification, but in terms of protein production, you usually want to avoid them. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about post-translational modifications. Good, so to come back to our troubleshooting issue here again, what we have um, is we have a protein that, that we're trying to produce. Uh, we, we take our whole cell lysate, we run it out, we see all the cells, uh, all of the proteins in, in the cell. Um, we, we add our IPTG, or we heat shock, or we do whatever it is that, or cold shock, or whatever, or do whatever it is that induces production of our protein. Um, and we expect a big fat band here, but in fact what we see is a tiny little band. Um, so you have very low expression. And the question is, what went wrong? Um, another thing that can happen besides just getting actual sort of very low levels is, is what you'll do. Usually when, when you produce your proteins, you, you take your cells, you lyse them, um, and then you have this nice cell lysate, but the cell lysate is, is full of soluble things that are useful and, and then a whole bunch of insoluble crap that you want to get rid of, membranes, 
um, cell wall, unlicensed cells, and, and, and any sort of cells, chromosomes and any sort of cell debris that you want to get rid of. So you'll do, you'll do this great big um, pelleting step at the beginning to get rid of all that insoluble crap. And what often ends up happening is, is despite having tons of protein here, you'll see that a lot of your protein comes down in this pellet. And that's a sure sign that your protein is, is aggregated. Um, it, it, they're, so they're in, insoluble aggregates, or what we often call inclusion bodies. Um, now, if you talk to a microbiologist, there's some sort of difference between the microscopist. There's some sort of difference between, between inclusion bodies and aggregates, and, and I don't really want to get into that. I'm going to call them both the same thing. Essentially what they are, they're just great big clumps of insoluble protein um, in your cell, and you can see them in, in um, say, an electron microscopy. You can also see them just on phase contrast uh, microscopy. What you'll see is a little phase bright spec or phase dark spec in your cell, and that's all of your protein that's getting produced, and that's a sure sign that it's probably actually aggregating. Um, and the aggregated protein, like I say, is usually not functional. See, I mean, most people say that you want to avoid this. I should add a caveat here that inclusion bodies are actually, they're, they're, they're dead useful if you can purify your protein this way. Um, so when, when you form an inclusion body, for, for reasons that are completely unknown, these inclusion bodies typically consist just of your, just of your protein of interest. They don't really have much else there. Um, and, and what's more... They, they, they pellet, but they don't pellet at the same speeds as all the cell debris. So the, the cell debris will all pellet at sort of a low speed. Um, and if you give it a sort of medium speed uh, centrifugation, so sort of not, not quite ultra centrifugation, but somewhere, somewhere between sort of a low speed centrifugation and ultra centrifugation, these, these, this protein, which is uh, this, these aggregates, which consist almost entirely of your protein of interest, will pellet out, and they'll be almost 100% pure. And if you're very lucky, you can take that protein and you can denature it. Um, usually we'll use things called chemical denaturants. I don't know if you've heard of urea or, or guanidinium. These are, these are chemical proteins that disrupt, um, that disrupt hydrogen bonds in the proteins, and usually they'll break up these aggregates and make them soluble. Now that protein will be denatured and still won't be active, but often you can take it, and if you dilute it out and dialyze away the, the guanidinium or the urea um, in a sort of gentle way, the, the proteins will refold into their, into their active conformations. And if you can do that, you can get a lot of really pure protein. Um, there's some reasons why you may not want to purify your protein this way. You know, for, for one thing, many proteins just, you, this just won't work, right? If you try and purify your protein this way and try and renature it, probably the reason that it aggregated in the first place was that it was a little bit unstable. It just didn't fold very well, and that, that's why it formed the aggregates. Um, but the other thing is, is that renaturing your protein um, can be, you know, if you're doing this on an industrial scale, can be a bit inefficient, right? You can get lots of really concentrated, really pure protein, at one step, but then essentially you have to take that nice concentrated protein, and in order to get active protein, you have to dilute it out to really high levels. Um, and, and that creates large volumes, and large volumes aren't necessarily what you, what you want. What's more is it's a little labor intensive, right, because it requires a couple of steps. It requires adding a denaturant, it requires diluting out the protein, it requires dialyzing away the denaturant, um, and all of that can take time, which, which may not be on your side. Good, so to think about how, we, how you can sort of start to address this. Um, this is not stuff that would necessarily be in an exam, right? But it's all stuff that would help me think about, you know, th th this is all sort of future stuff. This is proper class, not, I'm, not I'm, I'm trying to give you a certificate here, right? Um, it always helps me to understand the, the principles behind something. Um, so so it's, it's good to remember like, some basic principles behind protein folding. The, the first is that you know, proteins are essentially long linear polymers, but the long linear polymer in and of itself is not generally functional. Right? It has to fold, it has to go from being a long linear polymer, and it has to fold back on itself 
to form a three-dimensional structure, and it's that three-dimensional structure, or rather usually just a tiny portion of that three-dimensional structure. It's the actual functional bit that you're looking for. And there are two main forces that drive protein folding. We tend to think about protein folding in terms of enthalpic forces, right? This is stabilization of the, of the polypeptide chain um, when it goes into a solution, right? To, to, to go from, they, they always say going from order to, from disorder to order, there's some sort of sta stabilization. That's, that's your enthalpic force, right? Enthalpic forces include things like hydrogen bonding, um, and this is especially true for hydrogen bonds that form the back, with, with, with the backbone of the polypeptide, things that, like alpha helices, alpha helices and beta sheets. There are other hydrogen bonds that will hold the protein a bit more together to, to, to form a bit of the tertiary structure. These are things like um, van der Waals forces. So these are weak interactions where, where nature, a van der Waals force is basically just that nature abhors a vacuum, right? It doesn't like when there's no space in an, in an area. So... So two molecules that are close together will tend to cling to one another and stick to one another just to prevent a vacuum from being there. Um, and finally, you have electrostatic interactions, which are another form, sort of, depending on who you ask, are a form of weak um, intermolecular interactions, right? You have hydrogen bonds, which are, which are sort of, it's a weak interaction, but it's sort of starting to reach the, the strong interaction phases, but then you've got these weaker forces like van der Waals forces and electrostatic interactions. So that's a positively charged amino acid with a negatively charged amino acid, right? Um, but the main driver for protein folding, which is the, the, the factor that we always seem to forget about, um, are actually entropic effects. Um, and, and this includes something called the hydrophobic effect. Now, usually when people talk about the hydrophobic effect, they talk, they, they talk about van der Waals forces and the fact that you know, proteins like to stick to one another, and hydrophobic amino acids just like to stick to one another. But it's actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, but to, to get, but before we get to that, j just to remind you all, I don't know if, if any of you have done any biophysics, but, or basic biophysics, but when, when a protein folds, essentially you go, um, the, the first step in folding is something called the hydrophobic collapse. You, you, have, a, you have this long linear polymer, um, which is composed of hydrophobic residues, which are supposed to be these black residues, and hydrophilic residues, which are supposed to be these, these uh, white residues. And the hydrophilic ones tend to partition themselves to the outside of the molecule, and the hydrophobic ones tend to want to partition themselves to the inside of the molecule. Um, and like you say, it's... What drives this interaction is actually something rather, rather complicated and, ra and rather a bit more indirect than we usually feel comfortable talking about. Um, good, so don't pay attention to a lot of this. Essentially, what we have are two different forms of entropy that are fighting against one another. You've got a linear polymer, and that linear polymer, just through forces of entropy, wants to occupy as many different conformations. It's like a string wants to sort of occupy as many different conformations as possible. Right? The other sort of entropy, though, that we don't really talk about is something called solvent entropy. Now, the solvent itself actually wants to, also wants to order, occupy the most disordered state possible. Right? And it's usually just because water wants to keep bleeding off um, all this heat. There's all this thermal motion in the water, and the water molecules tend to, tend to bounce around and, and want to move, right? Because another mo water molecule will come in and sort of displace it. Now, what happens if you throw a hydrophobic uh, molecule in the middle of water is that the water, um, be, because you know, we all understand that, that water forms hydrogen bonds, right? Um, what happens is, is the, the water wants to uh, satisfy all of its hydrogen bonds in order to fulfill all the, the enthalpy that it possibly can, but it also wants to move around as much as possible. And when you throw, when you throw a hydrophobic molecule in the, in the middle of a water solution, what ends up happening is, is the water needs to crystallize around, essentially needs to crystallize around that hydrophobic little bit, right? Because the, the water can't satisfy a hydrogen bond by hydrogen bonding with this hydrophobic residue because it can't. Um, and that causes an ordering of the water around the hydrophobic residue. And, and the water doesn't, doesn't like that. 
So, so what's, what's much more energetically favorable is if you can bury that away. So for example, if this was a hydrophobic residue in the middle of a protein, this was a hydrophobic residue in the middle of a protein, right? The water is crystallized around this little black residue. And when the protein folds, now it's buried in the middle. The, the water can hydrogen bond with these hydrophilic residues, right? That's why they're hydrophilic. But, but then, it doesn't have to then it doesn't have to crystallize around these, these black residues. And that's, that's really the gist of the hydrophobic collapse. And, and it's, it's the main driver of the hydrophobic effect. Oh, good, I had that in there. And it's really these electrostatic interactions that, that further stabilize. After the hydrophobic collapse, you have all these weak interactions and electrostatic interactions that stabilize the, the molecule structure and, and give the thing that it's, its three-dimensional shape. Right, so, so that's meant to say that what we have is we have this balance between the conformational entropy of the, of the, of the polypeptide chain um, and these two sort of forces that are holding the, po the protein together, the, the hydrophobic effect and, the, and, the, and, and these enthalpic forces. And that means that, oh, hello, my screen's gone. Um, that means that folded proteins are really, the people who work on protein folding, we, we talk about these big, um, the, these big free energies of folding. Right? But, they, but they tend not to be very big free energies of folding. They're, they're actually, on, on, the big, on the large scale of things, if we talk about reversible reactions, they're actually, very, they're actually very small changes in free energy. So proteins are really very much on the verge of stability. And what that means is that in, in a given solution, the, I don't know if you remember your... your this is where it starts to get a bit more important, right? Um, if, you, if you remember your, your equilibrium chemistry, you'll know that as you get, as you get closer to the, to the TM or to the melting point, right? It, it, as, the, as the delta G becomes less and less and less negative, you approach a point where you have more and more and more unfolded proteins under equilibrium conditions in the cell, right? So, since these are not big changes, in, in the free energy of folding, what that means is that in solution, there's always a few molecules that are probably unfolded right? because the delta G of folding is not very large. Right? And as you approach conditions that, that, that say, you raise the temperature um, or you add a little bit of denaturant or you add a bit too much salt, as you approach, as, as you cause that delta G to become less negative, you increase the number of unfolded proteins in the cell. Um, this, is, right, this is the equation that dictates that, but don't, don't bother memorizing it. Right? You should all be familiar with this equation. You should be familiar with how you get from, th this is just standard equilibrium kinetics, so you should all be familiar with these equations already, but I'm not, I'm not going to ask any sort of questions about this. It's just to, to re-illustrate the point, right? If you have an unfolded protein and a folded protein, and they're in equilibrium, the, the, the free energy of folding is going to be, you know, you want it to be negative. So, so the equilibrium, the, and the delta G is dictated by the, by the equilibrium constant, right? So that's folded, concentration of folded and over unfolded. So as this becomes closer, to, if this number were really negative, most of your protein would be in the folded state. As this number comes close to zero, more, more and more protein is in the unfolded state. At, at zero, about 50% is in the unfolded state. Right, that's... that's that's all I mean to say about that. But just an interesting tidbit, too, on the side. I, I, I found several years ago that so somebody presented a presentation that there are lots of proteins um, that, have t that, that have a two-state equilibrium. You have a protein that's most stable at a, at a particular temperature. right? Usually we think, OK, you cool it down. Temper Temperature is the thing that dictates folding. So if you raise the temperature, the protein, you know, there's more heat energy, and that causes the protein to unfold because the, the polypeptide chain needs to breathe the bleed off the thermal motion of the, of the solvent. Um, right? So you, th this is sort of the inverse of the, of the delta G, right? This is the delta delta G. So instead of being negative, we're positive. But as we, as we re increase the temperature, we reach a point, a TM, on the hot side of things.
and, and on, on, on that side, the protein unfolds. We should all be familiar with that. But, but an interesting fact is that if you take your, your, very, your, your folded protein at the, at the, the best um, temperature for folding, and you decrease the temperature, at some point, you're actually decreasing the hydrophobic effect, right? Because at some point, the water, if it gets cold enough, the, wa the, the water starts to freeze itself. And if there's enough thermal motion in the, in the water already so that the water is a liquid, the protein can unfold. It doesn't happen with a lot of proteins, but it's something to be aware of. <laughs> um, and, and to me, it really drove home the point of, of, of how, how these different uh, conditions can actually affect protein folding. Good, so what happens when we, as we get closer to, the, to, to, to these areas where we have a, to these regions, temperatures, or conditions where, where, the, where the free energy of folding starts to get closer to zero? Or even, say, the best, the, the optimum temperature for folding is, 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 is actually still very close to zero. Um, well, what happens is, is you have more protein in the unfolded state, that, of course, that, right, your protein is now, it's an equilibrium between a folded and an unfolded form. Um, as, you get as, the, as the free energy of folding gets closer to zero, you have more protein in the unfolded form. And that folded form is, that unfolded form is then prone to degradation. So proteases can access this polypeptide chain and chop it into bits. Usually proteases won't digest a fully folded protein because the active site can't access the, the, the backbone of the polypeptide. Um, or the other thing is, is if this is concentrated enough, that protein will tend to aggregate. Uh, it'll, it'll tend to clump with itself. There, I think we'll talk about this. Um, one last thing about protein folding, and that's, that's to talk about, about folding kinetics. Um, usually, we think about protein folding as a, as a simple linear pathway. You produce an unfolded protein. That unfolded protein um, either goes, folds, collapses, and, 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 and goes straight to a folded protein, or say, collapses into a molten globule state, so some sort of intermediate um, with some secondary structure, and then, and then goes to a folded state. Um, and, and usually, we shouldn't worry about this form of the protein because this form of the protein d doesn't exist very much. What we're, what we're usually worried about is this intermediate here and the life of this intermediate. So the longer that intermediate is around, ah, screw energy diagrams, let's not talk about that this year. So, so actually, I mean, I present this as a, as a simple folding pathway, but... <coughs> But, but there are lots of studies that suggest it's actually a bit more complicated. Proteins can go from an unfolded state through an intermediate state, or sometimes they can go straight to the, to the folded state. But again, what we're worried about are these, are these sort of stable intermediates in, in protein folding. So things, what I mean by stable is not necessarily that they, they, they stay around all the time, but, but the fact that they, that, that they live, that, that they're around for a long enough period that, that something can happen, right? Complicated. Right, the, the, the problem is, is that if this, if this intermediate is around long enough, it's exposing sites on itself that, that are meant to, to interact with other bits of the protein right, to form the folded structure, but some of those bits can interact with itself. And if that happens, you can get two proteins coming together, and that's called a nucleation reaction. Right? And once that nucleation happens, you can get more intermediates building on that, li that little nucleus. And that builds and builds and builds until you get a, an aggregate. Right? And, and critically, the, the rate of, of, at which this protein aggregates, aggregates is dependent on two things. One is, is how frequently you build a, an aggregate, or a, a, a nucleus. nucleus the, the, that nucleus formation is, is really pretty random. Um, but the rate of nucleus formation and the rate at which you form, at which you extend onto that aggregate is dependent on the concentration of the intermediate 
and the, inter the concentration of the intermediate is, is dependent on the concentration of the fully folded form. Um, we could also talk about molecular chaperones. If there are molecular chaperone that were dependent for conversion of the intermediate form to the folded form, right? Are you all familiar with molecular chaperones? We'll talk about them in a little bit. Molecular chaperones are enzymes that help proteins fold. And there are some molecular chaperones that are required to convert sort of a stable intermediate to a, folded, a fully folded form. And the, 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 those, um, if you had, a, if you required a molecular chaperone to go from this state to this state, and you had too much of this and not enough molecular chaperone to sort of convert it into the folded state, you would also increase the amount of the intermediate. Right? So, so, so it depends on two things, the amount of unfolded protein and the rate at which you're converting this intermediate into the folded form. Right? And, and the more intermediate you have, the faster you build up aggregates. Right? So, so thinking about troubleshooting, that's, that's where we come back to the actual topic of the lecture. If, you, if you're using a T7 system to, pr to, to produce your protein and you're making lots and lots of protein in the cytoplasm of E. coli, and E. coli has a chaperone that, that, that will do the job, um, but there's just not enough of it in the cell. Say, say take, there, there's, a, there's a chaperone in called GROEL. Um, gr gr GROEL the, the, is required for the folding of some proteins in E. coli, but there's not a ton of it in the cell. Um, if there's not enough, if this protein requires GROEL, and, and GROEL is, is their hom homologous molecules that you find in eukaryotes, and, and, and it's actually required for the folding of some eukaryotic proteins in E. coli. Um, so if there's not enough GROEL on the cell and you've got too much of this protein, it'll tend to aggregate rather than fold, right? The, the, the unfolded protein will tend to aggregate. So what you can do is you just make less of the protein, right? If there's less of the protein, there's less chance of two, mo two unfolded molecules coming in contact with one another, right? Because they'll tend to fold rather than, rather than rather on their own rather than stick to one another. Right, so, so again, like I say, the key is that the aggregation depends on the concentration of the unfolded protein or the, the unfolded intermediate. So the solution is to lower the rate of protein production, at least, l lower the rate at which you, you, you synthesize um, proteins, and just express the protein for a longer period of time. There are lots of ways to do this. At the beginning of my talk, we, we talked about different sort of expression vectors, right? You could use a, a lower copy number expression vector. Um, you could use a less strong promoter. Um, so, so, so instead of using a T7 promoter, use or a, or a um, I don't know. You're probably not familiar with a P-trick promoter. They're optimized lactose promoters. You could use the sort of wild type lactose promoter, which which um, produces, which uh, expresses genes at a slightly lower level. Um, you could mod, but the way that most people sort of modulate gene expression, right, is is usually they only find this out. Right? This tends to be trial and error, right? You, you can't look at a protein and know it's going to aggregate. And so by this point, you've already cloned your protein into a T7 promoter, um, it, and, and, and you're set up to synthesize tons of the protein, and now you've got this expression vector, and you have to lower the expression again. So a lot of people will do that by, by co-expressing this T7 lysozyme at different levels to sort of tamp down the the rate of production of the protein. Um, you could also change, as we talked about in the last lecture, you could change the first few codons of the, of the, of the um, mRNA just to, just to sort of lower the, the rate of expression. Um, or you could use more slowly translated codons. In fact, uh, th there's a couple of very interesting papers. We're running a little low on time because we started late. There are a couple of interesting papers that you might want to look at. Um, so, so in this paper in particular, the, the authors, what they were trying to do is they were, they were looking at production of, of a luciferase in E. coli. It's a firefly luciferase, right? It doesn't come from E. coli. So the codons are not optimized for production in E. coli. Um, they're actually not even optimized for production in fireflies, right? Because you don't apparently need too much luciferase in the cell. And what they, what they found was that if you put, you could, you could optimize the codons for production in E. coli, and you would end up with lots more protein, but, so, 
So the, and the activity itself might be higher, but if you look at something called the specific activity, right? So that's the amount of activity you see per protein unit. You see the specific activity actually goes down. So each one, that there are fewer actual functional luciferase molecules. Um, and they, they theorized that was because luciferase is a protein that we also use for protein folding studies because it's very prone to, to denaturation and aggregation. Um, so so what, what the authors thought was, okay, what happens if we go back and we plug in different um, slow-reading codons? In fact, they can recover some of the specific activity from that just, just by slowing the rate of translation. Um, So, right, so there, so there are lots of different things that you can do. So you can use more slowly translated um, codons. You can also decrease the rate. That, so so there, there, there's one other thing that you can do, and this is, this is not, a, this is not a, a wonderful answer for, a for, a, for an exam, um, but, but, but it, it is an answer. But the, the way in real life, you know, you can optimize all of this. This is all stuff that you would want to put on an exam. In, in real life, what we tend to do is we just tend to take... So I'm, you know, we're splitting this into what can we, what can we um, sort of examine you over and, and what do we actually do. So in real life, what we actually do most of the time is, is you just take the, the culture um, and, and you can just lower the expression temperature. That, that has lots of effects, right? You produce the, pro you know, usually we think E. coli grows at 37, let's produce our protein at 37. Some people say, okay, let's produce it at 30. Um, but actually, I know a lot of people who, who no longer produce any of their proteins at sort of 37 or 30 degrees Celsius. They tend to just do an expression at, at 25 degrees overnight. That has several effects, right? One, it decreases the rate of translation. Um, translation, it, it seems, is just particularly prone to change, it's, it's particularly sensitive to changes in temperature. Um, the other thing it does is if you have a high copy number vector, it lowers the copy number. And again, for, for sort of unclear reasons, you go from having like 25 copies per cell to something like 10 to 12 copies per cell if you're using a, a standard cloning vector. Um, and then the other thing that it does uh, is, it, is it increases the stability of the protein by, by changing the physiology of the cell. So, so that brings up a, the topic of heat, right? Um, we keep talking about talking around heat and protein folding. Um, but there are multiple ways that heat can actually contribute to protein folding, both direct and indirect. You know, one is the standard sort of way. You increase the temperature, the protein unfolds because it just needs to move around through, through sort of entropic forces. Um, the other thing that happens, though, is you increase the rate of protein synthesis, right? If you lower the temperature and you decrease the rate of protein synthesis, if you raise the temperature, you'll probably increase it. But then finally, there's another indirect method by, by which it um, can decrease the stability of your protein, and that's, that's through something called the heat shock response. This is a complicated regulation pathway, but basically what the heat shock response is in E. coli is it senses unfolded proteins, right, and heat causes proteins to unfold. That gets sensed through the molecular chaperones of the cell, and when the molecular chaperones get overwhelmed, what that does is it feeds back and turns on the production of, of proteases and chaperones. You know, chaperones are great, right, because they'll help your protein fold, but what we're more worried about are those proteases. The, the, the goal of the protease is really to degrade proteins that are stuck, that can't be folded, aggregated proteins and things like this. Um, and it's a way of just sort of clearing the cell of all these unfolded proteins and sort of starting afresh. Um, so there, there are some solutions to this, right? One solution is to lower the expression temperature. Again, it's always lower the expression temperature. We already talked about that. But, another, but the other thing to do is to, instead of producing your protein in a standard E. coli strain, is to produce it in an E. coli mutant. That E. coli mutant can be defective for the, for the heat shock response, so, it's, so it could be defective for, for the sigma-32 protein, um, which is required for the heat shock response in coli. Um, or there are lots and lots of proteases in the cell, and you can start, the cells start to get a little bit sick, but you can start um, making mutations that get rid of many of these proteases. So for example, um, you could get rid of CLIP-XP and, and, and AP and LON and FTSH. 
really, we're usually not so worried about those proteases. Those are ATP-regulated proteases, and they tend to fall apart when, when you lyse the cells. What we're usually more worried about are these proteases that are produced in the periplasm and in the cell envelope. Um, they tend to be fairly strong proteases. Um, so you can produce your protein, and it'll be perfectly stable with, if you have it in the cell. But when you lyse the cell, what happens is um, you'll have all of these proteases that are, that are released into the, into the supernatant. Um, and now things like OMPT, which was previously in the outer membrane, now has access to your protein and can de degrade it. And things like the heat shock response in increase the production of OMPT, right? So you could just decrease the heat shock response, of course. But, but the other option is just to get rid of OMPT altogether. Cells don't need OMPT, so you can just get rid of it. You can also use protease inhibitors, right? So all sorts of companies sell, sell all sorts of cocktails for protease inhibitors. You're probably familiar with, you might be familiar already with a protease inhibitor called PMSF. We've been using this protease inhibitor for years. It modifies the active site serine and many serine proteases, which is the major type of protease in the cells. But, but you, can, you can buy cocktails of lots of different protease inhibitors from companies like Roche. They sell all different kinds. Um, and it would be worth doing a little bit of research uh, into those protease cocktails or protease inhibitor cocktails before you actually produce your protein. So, for example, Roche sells at least two different kinds of protease inhibitor cocktails, one of which contains EDTA and one of which does not. So EDTA, are you all familiar with EDTA? So EDTA is a chelating agent. It, it, and, it, and it binds to most divalent metals. We usually talk about it in, term, in, in, conjugate, in combination with magnesium, but actually it'll, it'll, it'll um, chelate lots of, of transition metals a lot better. One of them is zinc, and there are lots of zinc-dependent proteases in the cell. But your protein of interest might require magnesium, might require iron 2, might require manganese or something in order to function. Um, and so you wouldn't want to use an EDTA-containing cocktail with that. You would want to use some other protease inhibitor cocktail. They've gotten surprisingly good. Um, the PM, it used to be we just used PMSF, and if you were lucky, you'd, you increased the stability of your protein, and most of the time you weren't lucky and your protein got degraded. But the, but the cocktails have gotten really very good recently. You could also use a buffered media. It's always important to buffer your media. Usually we grow our, our media in LB, which is unbuffered. Um, but things like very low pH or very high pH can also cause protein unfolding. And when you lyse your cells, oh, well, it, it, that, that change, that they, they might already have the, the heat shock response on from this high or low pH. Or it could be even that, that, that it affects the pH of the buffer that you lyse your, your, your cells in. So it might be a good idea just to buffer your media. One last thing that, that people have tried to do is they've tried... Well, this is just a highlighted general point. So sometimes what you're trying to do is you're trying to produce a eukaryotic protein um, in a bacteria. And sometimes it just doesn't work, right? We're talking about organisms which are billions of years diverged. A couple of billion. Um, and even though they have very similar uh, chaperone systems, at, at least when you look at them on the surface, when it comes down to functionality, they just don't work as well. First of all, eukaryotes have many more chaperone systems. They have, this, they have an HSP90 system. E. coli has an HSP90 system too, um, but it doesn't work the, the same way. Um, all, all creatures seem to have this HSP70 system, which is this DNA KJ in E. coli. All systems seem to have this Groel protein, in e, which we, this protein, the chaperone that we call Groel in, in E. coli. Um, that's trick CCT in eukaryotes, but again, trick CCT doesn't work the same. It, it do, doesn't work on the same proteins as GROEL does. So it might just be the chaperone system. But one thing that you could, you might be able to do, is to co-express chaperones. Right? You could. It's possible that you could co-express a chaperone from eukaryotes that would help your eukaryotic protein to fold, or people have found just that, just that co-expressing bacterial chaperones can help your protein to fold. Um, and there are strains that you can buy that will help you to do that. 
finally, one, one sort of, again, a, a very cheap way of increasing the stability of your protein, and, and, and it's something that we really don't understand the basis for, um, is to fuse a soluble protein that folds well to one of the termini of your protein. Right, so what people have found is that if you fuse a protein like glutathione S transferase, or maltose binding protein, these are, these are typical tags that we fuse to proteins. What, what people have found is that you could have a semi-stable protein and just the presence of the maltose binding protein or the thyrodoxin 1 or whatever else increases, causes your protein to fold better. The, the, the physics are just completely not understood, but, but that's what happens. Um, so, so, so I put up a reference here to show you an example of fusing a protein, I think, to maltose binding protein, although I can't quite remember anymore. It's quite an old reference. Um, but one of the proteins that we've used in my lab is a, is a protein called SUMO. That's a small ubiquitin-like modifier from yeast. SUMO has two, has, has two benefits. One, it, it, it's a rock. Right? Proteins that fold really well we call rocks because they don't tend to unfold with heat. Um, but SUMO is a rock. And it has, it has another um, benefit in that, in that SUMO itself can serve as a site-specific protease. So you can use it as a tag for purification. If you fuse it to the end terminus of your protein, there are all these desumolases, which are really just proteases that recognize the sumo and chop the peptide bond at the C terminus of the sumo, leaving, leaving your protein alone. Um, and this can often stabilize your protein. Right, so this is, a, this is a picture of what that might look like. Yes? Sometimes, yeah. That, that can be an issue. And if your protein is functional with the tag and the tag doesn't interfere with whatever you need to use it for, then maybe you should just leave the tag there. Often you need to get rid of the tag. So if you're producing lots of protein for, say, x-ray crystallography, you need, you need lots of really pure protein, and you may think that the, the tag interferes with the conformation of your protein. You might want to get rid of the tag. So, so you know, it's often worth trying a small batch. Once you have your pure protein, trying a trying a small batch and cleaving, the, cleaving the, the tag from the end terminus of the protein, seeing if your protein aggregates. And if it doesn't, hey, fantastic, right? You've got pure protein. I, I don't, again, people don't quite understand why these tags work. They help the protein fold, but they don't seem to increase the stability of the final folded protein. So once it's folded, it seems to stay, stay stably folded, folded if you chop off the tag off and even, even unfold, even unstable proteins will stay folded. Um, but yeah, th th at, at this point, you know, once we've gone beyond, once we've gone beyond translation, we're sort of entering the area of, hey, let, let's try it out. We, we've got sort of a theoretical framework to start, to start tinkering around with this to see if we can improve protein production. Um, but we don't really understand what's going on, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of trial and error. Good. We're going to stop from this morning. We talked a lot about protein folding. I, I hope this is picking up my voice. It, look, it looks like it is, but I don't see a microphone. That makes me nervous. Um, but you're all here, so you'll remember. Um, anyway, so this morning we talked about, about protein folding and, and problems that you can have with protein folding. Right? And, and, and most of these problems were intrinsic to, to folding of the protein itself. Right? We, we, talked, a we talked a bit about heat and sort of protein folding. We talked about concentration of unfolded intermediates and the problems of protein aggregation. Um, and, then, and then finally we talked about molecular chaperones. This, this is a bit external to the protein, but, but still really has to do, you know, we, we haven't sort of moved beyond the cytoplasm. We haven't done anything complicated yet. It's just that these proteins have a difficult time um, folding. But... <laughs> Uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but there's another thing that can influence how your protein folds and whether it folds correctly or not. And that, that's the localization of the protein, right? All of the processes that we've been talking about so far in the bacterium are, are in this compartment right here, the cytoplasm. 
right? That's where all of the DNA is. It's where the RNA polymerases are. It's where all the nucleotides are. It's where all the amino, well, the, they're amino acids out here, but, but they're not useful for anything because all of the ribosomes, the tRNA synthetases, and everything else are here in the cytoplasm. Um, but there, there are a lot of proteins for, for various reasons that, that really don't fold very well in, in the cytoplasm. That sounds a little bit strange because the cytoplasm is supposed to be nicer for folding, right? It's supposed to have all these chaperones um, as opposed to the, to the periplasm or the extracellular milieu, which are full of, of, of proteases and things to get rid of, of, um, of any sort of proteins. But there is this sort of rule, and it's a, and it's a general rule, right? It's, it's one of these rules of thumb. Um, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, but we have this rule of thumb, right? It, it means that, that it's like it means that it, it's just sort of a, a say that something that people say, and, and most of the time it's true, maybe. Um, anyway, so there's this general rule that you're supposed to produce the protein uh, where it's normally expressed in the cell. Now, obviously, if you're making a, a eukaryotic protein, a eukaryotic protein is never going to be in the periplasm, but the closest, in, in some ways, the closest compartment to say. The, to the ER lumen or a, or a lysosome or um, one of these other compartments, it is the periplasm. Um, and the way that proteins get into the get into the periplasm or the extracellular milieu, the, the first step in this process is carried out by machinery called the SEC machinery. It's a machinery that I know very well, but I won't go into detail um, about it today. That basically, uh, for most proteins, at least most soluble proteins, what will happen is the whole protein is synthesized. These proteins typically have a targeting signal um, somewhere in their, in their primary structure. That, that that's usually takes the form of an N-terminal signal sequence. That N-terminal signal sequence allows it to get recognized by the translocation machinery um, and translocated across the membrane through this channel that's formed by these proteins, sec Y, E, and G. Um, with the help of an ATPA, SEC A. Um, it can also have the help of a chaperone called SEC B. Um, and what SEC B does is it keeps proteins unfolded. So, I um, should mention that this channel, that there are a couple of uh, salient features about this, about this pathway. And, and one is that this channel requires that proteins be unfolded in order to pass through it. The whole thing is only large enough so that, so that it'll fit, depending on who you believe but it'll only fit a, a fully denatured protein through it. Um, there's some other groups that claim that it can fit something slightly larger, but even still, it's not going to fit a, a whole folded protein through the channel. So that's, that's one aspect of this. And what, what sec B does is it's, it's a molecular chaperone, and it just keeps the proteins from folding before they can be translocated. And that brings up the second salient feature of this translocation pathway, and that's that in bacteria... This is, this is unlike the majority of translocation in most eukaryotes. Um, in bacteria, most soluble proteins and, and outer membrane proteins and gram-negative bacteria are, are usually fully or, or mostly fully synthesized before they can be translocated across the membrane. Right? Now, if you make a fully folded protein, that means that that has a chance to fold. And if the protein folds, it won't go out through this channel anymore. It's stuck. Um, Good. So, those are just all things to bear in mind. Usually, there's no problem. But often, there's no problem exporting your protein. Um, so, right? What you can do if you want to produce your protein in the periplasm is you can just artificially fuse an E. coli signal sequence to your protein of interest, and usually it'll get recognized, and at least a fraction of it will get transported across the membrane to the periplasm. Maybe even most of it, depending on the depending on the, uh, the substrate protein. Um, it's worth noting that the signal sequences are very similar across evolution. They all look roughly the same. But it's, it's best to take a signal sequence from... To, if you're going to express a eukaryotic protein in E. coli and you want to put it in the periplasm... Um, it's best to use an E. coli signal sequence to replace the native signal sequence with an E. coli signal sequence. There are some differences. Um, so, for example, E. coli signal sequences tend to be a little bit more hydrophobic. Uh, 
the full differences aren't entirely known. You can spot the differences using a neural network program, but we don't really know how that whole thing works. Um, anyway, so, so in fact, th this is a way of producing proteins that people have known for years, and there are lots of, th there are lots of signal sequences that have been put into um, se secretion vectors. So for example, the signal sequence for a protein called PELB. Why people picked up PELB, I don't know. It's not even found in K12. It just happened to be a signal sequence that people thought worked really well and gave really good expression. Um, so, so just empirically, they stuck this PELB signal sequence in frame um, with the translation start site, and you just clone your, your protein in frame with the PELB signal sequence, and now you've got your protein piece to a signal sequence. Um, some other ones that you can use from sort of uh, the, the, the native uh, e. coli K12 are the signal sequence for maltose binding protein, or another one that people frequently use is the signal sequence from alkaline phosphatase, or, or FOA. So like I say, the, one of the issues with this pathway is that if you make a fully folded protein, it can fold, and that folded protein won't go out across the membrane. So if you have a protein that folds reasonably rapidly, what will end up happening is, is a small fraction of it, or even a large fraction of the protein, will get stuck in the cytoplasm. Um, and that, that, that sort of getting trapped is, is basically irreversible. One way that, that people have found around this, that th this is generally not used as much for protein production, but, um, but it is used in, in biotechnology sometimes to produce proteins for other purposes, um, is to fuse a different sort of signal sequence to the end terminus. So uh, most signal sequences will target proteins for translocation by this pathway, which we call post-translational, because protein is synthesized before it goes out. But there's a small um, subset of signal sequences that will get recognized very early in translation by a machinery called the signal recognition particle. And this is analogous to the signal recognition particle in, in eukaryotes. And what it'll do is it'll recognize that, that signal sequence and take the entire translating ribosome and couple it to the channel. So essentially, you're synthesizing the protein directly into the channel and across the membrane. Um, so if your protein folds really rapidly and you really want to put it in the periplasm, your best bet is to take a signal sequence from a protein like, like DSBA, uh, which will target proteins to this SRP-dependent co-translational pathway, um, and it'll go out uh, more quickly. So, so, what the, so this, is, this has been useful, for example, in, in phage display. So what these authors down, down here did um, is they were trying to express a protein called a DARPIN, um, are you all familiar with phage display? F phage display is, is, is a method for selecting um, two proteins that, that, that's for sort of randomly mutagenizing one protein and selecting it to interact with, with another protein. Um, you should look into the method. Right? It's, it's, it's sort of a neat method. Um, but, but basically, what, what it requires you to do is to take your DARPIN and to secrete it out by the SAC pathway and put it on the surface. And the problem, um, and you can do this with any protein, it doesn't matter if it's a DARPIN or a, or a monoclonal antibody or, or, any, or, or any other such thing. Um, but in this case, they were interested in a class of proteins called DARPINs because DARPINs are protein interacting proteins and they, they thought that would be cool. Um, so the problem with DARPINs is that they fold too rapidly and what the, what the authors found is that, that they just couldn't get very good express production of the phage that they're using for their phage display, what they found is that if they put the DSBA signal sequence or other signal sequences that will target proteins to this co-translational pathway, they suddenly found that their proteins were really, were exported really well to the periplasm and they got this huge bo boost in, in phage production. And, and this is a little counterintuitive because this, this signal sequence often doesn't promote as good of sy synthesis of the protein in the cytoplasm as these signal sequences do, but because phage display requires that the proteins are translocated across the membrane, um, that's what caused this whole, th th that's what sort of led to this improvement in, in translocation. Good, another reason why you might want to put a protein, so, you know, so, so the question is, is, why do you want to put a protein in the periplasm in the first place. Well, one reason is just if you're doing phage display, like they say, there's some methods that require you to put the protein into the periplasm. Um, 
Um, but another reason why you might want to put a protein in the periplasm is that lots of proteins contain disulfide bonds. Um, so, I, just to take a couple of examples, there's a protein called aprotonin, um, which is produced uh, for various reasons. They're, they're, they're antibodies that, that are made for biotechnological purposes. And these, these proteins all contain one or, or several uh, disulfide bonds in them. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe the literature has changed in the meantime, but when I was a student, we all learned that disulfide bonds form spontaneously. But this is actually wrong. Um, there's actually dedicated machinery in, in the periplasm called the DSB machinery. Did I put it up here? Yep, called the DSB machinery that's involved in making disulfide bonds. Um, so if you put your protein out into the periplasm, this machinery, so this protein DSBA, will transfer a disulfide bond to your substrate protein, and that'll, that'll lead to disulfide bond formation. I should mention, also, you probably, probably people, have, you might have heard that the periplasm is oxidizing, or that the ER lumen is oxidizing, and the, and the cytoplasm is reducing. There's actually dedicated machinery in the cytoplasm that's dedicated to keeping disulfide bonds from forming. So any disulfide bonds that accidentally form in the cytoplasm get actively reduced. Um, that's the thyrodoxin glutaridoxin pathways. Right. Another reason why you might want to put your, your, your protein in the periplasm is there's also a second machinery that if this, if this disulfide bond is, is the wrong disulfide bond, if it doesn't allow it to fold, there's this, there's this disulfide bond isomerase called DSPC, um, which will take your protein, reduce it, and then allow, give it another go at, at protein folding. all really useful when we start thinking about protein folding, um, mostly just because it's, it's worth knowing uh, that this machinery exists, because what, what, what it suggests is that it depends on how you export the protein to the periplasm. If there are two different pathways for exporting proteins to the periplasm, um, there's this, like we say, there's this post-translational pathway and there's this co-translational pathway. And depending on the pathway it picks, uh, that, that, that a protein picks, you'll get different methods of disulfide bond formation. Um, most proteins in E. coli, uh, so E. coli is really set up to form disulfide bonds between consecutive cysteines. So, so, so what I mean by that is you, you might have four cysteines in a protein, right? You've got cysteine 1, cysteine 2, cysteine 3, cysteine 4. Um, and, it, and in E. coli, E. coli preferentially forms disulfides between 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. Um, but there are a lot of proteins, like a protonin, that form disulfide bonds between cysteine 1 and cysteine, what is that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? Between cysteine 1 and cysteine 6, right? But the, but the disulfide bond machinery in E. coli will preferentially form it between 1 and 2. So you need this, this, this machinery to break that disulfide bond and give it another go at folding, yes? Um, so are you saying that all the proteins in the cytoplasm have um, disulfide bonds? As a geneticist, I'm very loath to rule anything out, um, but categorically. But as a general rule, yes, that's the case. There, there really aren't any disulfide bonds in in, in native, in, in native um, cytoplasmic proteins. I think, um, and I don't remember my enzyme mechanisms well enough to remember, but, there, but I think maybe ribonucleotide reductase forms a disulfide bond as part of its catalytic cycle, and, and, and I think you need thyrodoxin to re-reduce that. At least I, I know that the reason the reductive systems, so if you knock out all the reductive systems in the, in the, in the E. coli cytoplasm, thyrodoxin one thyrodoxin two, or even just thyrodoxin reductase, and glutaridoxin reductase. Um, that that kills all the, the reductive pathways in the cytoplasm, and the cells die. And the reason that they die is because ribonucleotide reductase can't get re, re reduced, and you can't make so ribonucleotide reductase turns NTPs into DNTPs. Um, and if you can't make DNTPs, 
your dad, right? <laughs> um, so as far as I know, there are no proteins that form disulfide bonds normally in the cytoplasm. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. Good, so, so depending on the pathway you export proteins by, that can also affect whether you get disulfide bonds between one and two and three and four, right? Whether you get this preference for, for disulfide bonds between consecutive disulfide bonds and non-consecutive disulfide bonds. Um, so if you export proteins by the co-translational pathway, you'll, you'll prefer to get disulfide bonds between one and two and three and four. If you export proteins by the post-translational pathway, you're supposed to, to prefer to get, you're supposed to allow the protein to export and then get, go through a, a, a preliminary folding step, which might allow your proteins to fold a bit more natively before you get disulfide bond formation. It's all a bit of hand-waving, right? But what it tells you is that you might want to try more than one. If you're really having problems producing your protein in the periplasm and you really need to put it in the periplasm to produce it, you might want to try different export pathways to get it out there because it could affect the folding of the protein. Um, another reason why you might want to put the protein in the periplasm, just as an aside, is, is that Recently, uh, a group here has come up with a way of producing proteins directly into the media. Right now, now we've been talking about protein folding in the periplasm, um, but there might be. But but what this group has done is they've produced a way of, of they've come up with a way of producing a protein that, that will get your protein cleaner in the first step. And basically, it relies on this secretion system that that inserts proteins into the outer membrane. Um, and when the protein gets inserted, basically what you have is you have a beta barrel protein that gets inserted into the outer membrane, and you have a passenger portion, and that, that, that's your protein of interest, right? You have a signal, a signal sequence that targets the protein for translocation across the membrane, and this system, what happens is, is this, this beta peptide, which is this, this outer membrane protein, inserts into the outer membrane and drags your passenger protein along with it. And once it's out into the periplasm, there's a proteolytic event that cleaves between the passenger and this, this outer membrane protein and releases the protein into the media. And now all you have to do is spin down your cells and you've got pure protein, assuming you can concentrate it enough. Um, and everything that we've talked about so far also comes down, uh, also applies to this, right? If you have a protein that folds rapidly, it may never get out across the cytoplasm. It may never get out across through the SEC machinery and across the membrane. So, so you may want to export that protein co-translationally. There's some problems with producing. So, so to come back to the to the this point from earlier, that there's some problems with producing proteins in the periplasm, and they're, they're actually well-known problems because people have been trying to do this for years and years. Um, you have all these complications that we've been talking about with, the, with protein folding and protein translocation, and, and maybe the, the, the way that the protein is exported might affect the way the protein folds, and once it's out there, you have another protein folding problem, right? especially if you're making a eukaryotic protein. Uh, even if it's produced in the, in the ER lumen, the ER lumen contains ATP and has ATP-dependent chaperones. The periplasm of E. coli doesn't have any ATP, so there are no ATP-dependent chaperones. Um, and that includes things like HSP-70s. So HSP-70s are a major class of chaperones. So there are no HSP-70s in the periplasm of E. coli. So if your protein requires an HSP-70 to fold, it won't fold, it won't fold in the periplasm of E. coli. The, the other thing is, that we sort of alluded to this earlier, is, is that there are lots of periplasms, or there are lots of proteases in the periplasm of E. coli. Um, so if you put your, well, more peri, probably more proteases than you find in the ER lumen, so if you put your protein out into the, into the periplasm, um, it might just get degraded. So people, because of this, people have described the periplasm as a very harsh environment for protein folding. But there is an alternative to this, um, and that's, 
that you can produce your protein in the cytoplasm, right? And, and, and the trick to this is to overcome this reducing environment of the cytoplasm. So just talking about this pathway a little bit ago, um, there are two different pathways for reducing disulfide bonds in the cytoplasm. There's one that's called the glutarodoxin pathway. Right? You've probably all heard of glutathione. It's a small molecule um, that, that, that contains a single cysteine. That glutathione can reduce proteins directly, or it can reduce this class of proteins called glutarodoxins. And glutarodoxins can then reduce a protein of interest. Um, the, the, most, the most important one is this protein, ribonucleotide reductase. Without reduction of ribonucleotide reductase, cells won't grow. Um, the, other, the other pathway is, is this thyrodoxin pathway, um, which, so there's a class of proteins called thyrodoxins that can reduce your protein of interest. In both pathways, you need a way of, you need a way of re-reducing your, your glutathione or glutarodoxins or thyrodoxins. In the glutathione pathway, there's a protein called glutathione reductase, which reduces glutathione, oxidized glutathione, back to reduced glutathione. In the thyrodoxin pathway, there's a protein called thyrodoxin reductase, which is reduced by, um, which reduces thyrodoxins, and both pathways are, are dependent on NAD, NADPH. Um, now, like I say, if you knock out both of these pathways, you don't get re-reduction of ribonucleotide reductase, and the cells eventually die. Right? So, no good. But what you can do is, it, it turns out um, that somebody found a long time ago that if you, if you knock out one of these pathways, in particular, this, this, this thyrodoxin, if you knock out this protein thyrodoxin reductase, what'll happen is this thyrodoxin, thyrodoxin 1 in particular, will get oxidized eventually by, by reducing um, ribonucleotide reductase, right? So ribonucleotide reductase is oxidized. Thyrodoxin reductase picks up the disulfide bond from, from ribonucleotide reductase and in the process becomes oxidized. Um, and th now you've got an oxidized thyrodoxin in the, in the cytoplasm. And what thyrodoxin does, strangely enough, if you're overproducing a protein, is it'll, it'll pass that disulfide bond off onto a protein of interest. Um, and so so you, can, you can see this. The, the way they first found this was they were producing an alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase is normally a periplasmic protein. Um, and it requires two disulfide bonds in, in order to, to be functional. And what they, what they did was they took the signal sequence away. So the protein is cytoplasmic, right? And what, what they found is that if you knock out thyrodoxin reductase, you now, get thyro you now get some alkaline phosphatase activity. Actually, pretty good alkaline phosphatase activity, all of which depends on thyrodoxin 1. That has several advantages, right? If, if, you, if you're now producing your protein in an oxidizing cytoplasm, you now have ATP-dependent chaperones around, things like DNAK, so this is your HSP70, or the chaperone in GROW-EL. Um, you've also got lots of glutathione around, right? So the, so the ER lumen also has lots of glutathione in it that can sort of help buffer disulfide bonds. So it serves as sort of an exchange mechanism. Um, and like I say, both of these are present in the ER of eukaryotes. Um, what the group that, that sort of started doing this work found was, was that they could then, what they then did was they knocked out glutathione reductase. Um, now when you knock out both of these pathways, the cells should be dead, but for some reason they pick up a suppressor really frequently. Um, you don't need to know about the suppressor, but the suppressor just allows them to live. But when you knock out both of these pathways and you have this, the, a, 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 a third mutation that allows you to live, this process becomes even more efficient. And there, there are companies that, that sell derivatives of this strain. Um, one of those, that, that the one that, that most people will be familiar with, is one called origami. It's been around for ages. Um, and another one is called shuffle, which is basically origami, but, it, but, it, but, what, but what New England Biolabs has done is they put in a plasmid that contains a disulfide bond isomerase to sort of help, help disulfide bond formation. Um, and using this, people have used the, these sort of methods to make things with really complicated um, disulfide bonding uh, patterns, things like antibodies and aproton 
Um, it's probably, it's, it's still really difficult to produce, to produce a, a whole antibody in E. coli, right? Um, but what people have done is they've taken this variable bit, or just just the the, the, the variable fragment, the variable um, domain of, of of the antibody, um, and have been able to, to produce those in the cytoplasm of E. coli, and, and that works a little bit better than putting it into the periplasm for some reason. Good, so that's where I sort of want to end with protein production and bacteria. We can keep going down the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> we, we, we've started to get more and more and more fiddly as we've gone on, right? And, and, and th th there are companies that sell all sorts of little fiddly things to just improve your protein um, production methods just a little bit more so that you can get more and more and more um, and, and better and better, better purified protein. Uh, but at some point, you, you're just going to say, okay, I've had enough. I, it's time to stop fiddling around. Maybe we, we're producing a eukaryotic protein. Maybe we should take that eukaryotic protein and produce it um, in a eukaryote. Now, you, you'll cover eukaryotic protein expression in, 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 in like cell culture in another lecture. Um, but there are microbes that people frequently use for production of, of proteins. Um, so microbial uh, eukaryotes that people use. Now, before we go into that, I just want to reprise again, right? That's so, so everything that applies to protein production in bacteria also applies to pr protein production in eukaryotic microorganisms, right? So you want to pick an expression vector. And again, you have to remember that, that the most important thing is that you want the highest level of expression possible, right? Because the goal is to produce as much functional protein in as short a period of time as possible. Um, high expression may lead to toxicity, it may lead to protein folding or aggregation, or it may induce the heat shock response, all of which exist in eukaryotes too. We have all of these, these choices that you have to pick. You have things like gene dosage, you have gene, gene regulation, you've got repressors and activators, you've got your on-off switch mechanisms, and you have inhibition of, of, of production using this T7 lysozyme, so you have ways of fiddling with protein production. Um, or you can change the mechanism of induction. Good. So why might you want to use a eukaryotic mechanism? So we, we've covered s some of this stuff. Why might you want to use eukaryotic microbes as opposed to using cell culture? Well, one reason is that they'll grow to high cell densities just like bacteria will, and you can get them in nice culture flasks under sort of anaerobic conditions so that they're just chugging away, right? Um, producing protein. Um, they, have, they usually have relatively simple growth requirements. They're always a little bit more complex than bacteria are generally. <coughs> Often they're, they're a little bit oxytrophic and require some supplementation of the media, but still, it's, a, it's usually a pretty simple media that you're growing these things in. Um, you can grow them in huge batches and fermenters. They're rel they have relatively rapid growth rates, though again, not quite as fast as E. coli, but, but a lot faster than, say, cell culture. Um, and some of these tools, some of these um, euk eukaryotic microorganisms have really well-developed genetics. Um, in, in particular, We've been doing genetics, well, I haven't been, but, but there have been many groups doing genetics on this eukaryotic microbe right here, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for years and years. So, so it's got a really well-developed um, genetic system, and that genetic system, what we've learned from, from studying Saccharomyces, is we've learned how to carry those genetics over to other eukaryotic microbes. Um, and the one that we're, we'll be most interested in is this one, is... is not, not Pichia methanolica, but Pichia pastoris. So again, here, here are some examples of proteins that, that, that might be useful, that, that might be useful to produce in eukaryotes, things that have really complex folding pathways that require eukaryotic chaperones, things that require the special environments of the eukaryotic ER or, or the eukaryotic um, cytoplasm,
um, and things with, with more complex disulfide bonds than can be handled by the, by the, by the E. coli machinery. Um, they're also, so, so bacteria tend to be a lot simpler in terms of, of, of what sorts of post-translational modifications they make. So, so E. coli really makes one kind of post-translational modification. Um, well, it makes a few different kinds of post-translational modifications. There's disulfide bonds. We haven't talked about acetylation or phosphorylation, but even where it makes some of these, these but it doesn't make um, N-linked glycosylations for the most part or O-linked glycosylations for the most part to proteins. Um, and even where it does make modifications that, that are made in eukaryotes, they're, off, they're not made with the same machinery, and so the same residues aren't phosphorylated or acetylated um, or methylated. Right? So, so, so rather than take all of that machinery from eukaryotes and put it in E. coli, it might just be easier to take your protein and put it in a eukaryote. It's also worth considering what, when you might just skip moving on to, to a eukaryotic microbe. So, for example, if you're producing a mammalian protein, there are lots of, there are lots of post-translational models. And, and the reason that you're producing your protein in, in a yeast is because it needs uh, a, a certain type of post-translational modification, so for example, a, a glycosylation. Um, that, glycos that, that sort of modification may happen in yeast, but it may be a, a totally different type of, of post-translational modification. So, so for example, a glycosylation of, of proteins, you, you'll, you'll tend to get glycosylation at the same residues in, in lots of different um, eukaryotic, in eukaryotic microbes as, as you do in, in, say, mammalian cells. But the type of glycosylation that happens is much different. So, so if, you're, if you want to make a drug that you're going to inject in humans, you'll have a different glycosylation pattern, and that will get picked up by the immune system. Um, and, and you could cause an immune reaction to your drug, which could render your drug inactive or cause an immune shock or some sort of immune shock to the, to the host. Um, And there are a very few proteins that really require specialized um, metazoan or mammalian chaperones in order to be produced. And of course, if you're making a bacterial protein, there's really no reason to produce the protein in, in Pichia, right? So again, just, just to say the things that we need to consider, we need to consider everything that we considered in E. coli. Um, Basically, like I said, all of this stuff with codon optimization and optimization and translation carries over, you know, almost one for one for picky as it does for E. coli, so we won't cover that. Um, culture conditions, we, we don't need to talk about optimizing culture conditions. You can look these up online, and, and it's a little bit of voodoo anyway, right, picking the right culture conditions to produce your protein. Um, and things that can affect protein folding we won't cover either just because, again, it starts to get very fiddly. But what we will talk about is sort of what, what sorts of vectors are available, um, the choice of promoters that you have, your choice of strain, um, and then finally the, how you might put your protein into the most appropriate compartment. Good. And for the most part, we're going to be talking about this organism, Pichia pastoris. You could produce your protein in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There's certain reasons that you might not want to produce your protein in Saccharomyces. Um, one of those reasons is that Saccharomyces is very difficult to lice, whereas Pichia is, is, is a little bit easier. Um, so people have preferred to do their genetics in Saccharomyces and preferred to do their protein production in Pichia pastoris. Um, there are really two sorts of plasmids. There, there are two sorts of, of uh, expression vectors in, in Pichia. One of those is plasmids, so yeast have plasmids. Humans don't really have plasmids, but yeast do have plasmids, and plasmids tend to be relatively high copy number. They're not high copy number like E. coli high copy number, but, they, but they, you do have, like, say, up to 10 copies of this gene per cell. Um, usually, one of the nice things about using a plasmid is that these plasmids have or bacterial origins of replication. Right? These, bac these origins of replication won't be recognized by the yeast um, replication machinery, um, but they do have a, a bacterial origin of replication, so you, you can grow it in bacteria, and then they have a separate origin of replication for growth in, in eukaryotes, and that just makes it easy to manipulate, manipulate your DNA in bacteria, and then you just put it in your yeast. Um, the one issue with, with 
uh, with using plasmids is that in yeast, uh, unlike in bacteria, so bacterial plasmids are, are usually, they're a little bit unstable, but they're usually pretty stable. You, you should select for them all the time, right? Bacterial plasmids always have some sort of antibiotic marker so that you make sure that your bacterial strain always has the antibiotic in it. But if you don't, most of your culture will still have the plasmid. That's not really true with yeast. Ye yeast kick out plasmids pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so what people have done instead is, is one, one benefit to using yeast as opposed to E. coli is that it's, it's really easy to transform your yeast with a linear piece of DNA um, and to recombine that bit of DNA into the chromosome using homologous recombination. Are you all familiar with the homologous recombination? You should be, right? So if you, if you have a bit of DNA sequence in, in say, a PCR product that matches the DNA sequence in, in the host chromosome, you'll get homologous recombination between the two. Um, and, and if you get two homologous recombination, you can replace that bit of genome with your PCR product. Right, and, and chromosomal integration is usually very stable. One of the really neat things too, at least in Pikia, is that you can get arrays of this. You can, it won't be, it won't be terribly stable, but what you can do is that if you take, if this is, if say part of this is your gene of interest, you can also put in a gene that encodes zeomycin resistance. Zeomycin resistance is, has something called gene dose dependence. Right? So, so if you have one copy of a, of a gene, of a zeomycin resistance gene, you, you have one level of resistance. If you double the number of zeomycin resistance genes, you increase the resistance. And if you add more and more and more zeomycin, what you can do is you can amplify this into a giant array. Right? And by, by amplifying zeomycin resistance, you'll also end up usually amplifying the, the, the the, the number of genes that encode your protein of interest, and this can lead to much higher production levels. Um, now, th this is really just a side point. I'm sure that most of you know this already, but, but we need to think when we, when we start picking our, our expression vector, we also have to consider what promoter we need to use. And, and I, I know that most of you should know this already, but bacterial transcriptional promoters will not work in, pa in Picchia pastoris. You have to pick a different promoter. Um, and for, for Picchia, there tends to be three choices. That there's one that's this, this alcohol um, dehydrogenase, AOX1, which is involved, which normally promotes the synthesis of a methanol dehydrogenase, which, which Picchia uses to grow. Um, there's another one for glyceraldehyde phosphatase, G, the GAP gene. That's a, that has a different levels of induction depending on the, um, the carbon source that you use, right? So if you're growing on glucose, you get really good expression. You could grow the protein on galactose and get a slightly different expression level, or you could grow it on glycerol and get a, a totally different level. And if you knew which carbon source you wanted to use, then you could vary the expression of your protein depending on how much, depending on which carbon source you use. Or finally, there's one called YPT1, which is just a nice constitutive promoter. There are some other ones, and you can look into them, and the benefits of those, those are like the DHAS promoter, the FLD promoter. Um, your choice of strain frequently, again, this, you, this will depend like an E. coli, it depends on your induction mechanism. Um, Pikia have, it, the, the most common way of inducing protein expression in Pikia is to use one of these AOX promoters. Um, so, so normally, Pikia grows on methanol. Um, and if you were to take a wild type Pikia pastoris strain and try and induce expression of your protein using, using an AOX1 allele, uh, what would happen is, is you would induce expression of this alcohol dehydrogenase that, that Pikia uses to grow on methanol. Um, and that would lead to sort of, a, a, because you'd be using up the methanol, that, then that would lead to, to down-regulation of the AOX gene from your own copy of the promoter. 
um, which, which means that you wouldn't necessarily get great expression. So, so in a mute plus strain, it's very useful because you can, you can add methanol as the carbon source and your strain would grow on that and methanol would also induce the production of the your protein of interest. The problem is with doing that is that the amounts of methanol that you would need to induce your protein of interest are so huge that it's a giant fire hazard, right? We're talking about 20%, 30% methanol that you're just dumping into a fermenter, which isn't great. Um, so what people have done is they've, they've mutated these two, AO, these two alcohol dehydrogenase genes. Um, there's a mute S strain where they've just mutagenized the, the AOX1 um, gene. And in that one, that one has, that can be induced at slightly lower levels of methanol. It's sensitive to low levels of methanol. So if you add, if you add too much methanol, um, the strains suddenly die. Um, so, so, so instead of like dumping in methanol and allowing the bacteria to grow on the methanol, you usually have to supplement with another carbon source. Um, but you still get good production of your protein. And finally, people have, have decided have made a strain where they've where they've taken out both uh, alcohol dehydrogenase genes. Um, and that leads to, to tighter control of expression, but, but the upshot is, is that now your sense cells are sensitive to methanol. For, for the same reason that you're sensitive to methanol, I should add, is that, is that the first step in, in alcohol dehydrogenase turns methanol into, into formaldehyde, and that, that, that sort of pickles you. Good, so now you've picked out your expression vector. You can pick out your, your inducible expression. And now, now the, the goal is to, is to pick out the most appropriate compartment. And again, the general rule is produce the protein where it's normally expressed. So secrete secreted proteins, ER proteins go to the ER lumen, cytoplasmic proteins go, go to the cytoplasm. With yeast, you have all, if you're producing a eukaryotic protein, you have all these options, right? You can put a Golgi protein in the Golgi because, because Pythia has a Golgi. You can put it one in the ER because, because it has an ER, and, and you just need to attach the right sequences to your protein to get it produced in the right compartment. Um, so to get a protein to the ER, the Golgi or the media, the first thing you need to do is get it across the membrane. Um, by the SEC pathway, again, is, is the major pathway for getting things across. That pathway is conserved in, in organisms, in, in, in E. coli and, and in Pichia but it uses slightly different signal sequences. These are some common signal sequences, so the, the pre pro alpha mating factor from, from um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae seems to work fairly well. Um, there's an acid phosphatase one or, the, or an invertase signal sequence that, that also work. Um, if you want your protein to get re retained in the right compartment, you may need to attach other, signal, uh, other sorts of signals to it. So for example, th there's an ER retention sequence called the KDEL sequence. Um, usually the C terminus of the protein that allows the, 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 the trafficking machinery to recognize um, a protein that's in the, the Golgi as belonging in, um, in the ER and, and can traffic it back to the ER. Um, I should mention that that's really important because, again, we talk about post-translational modifications. Depending on what compartment you're in, you have a slightly different post-translational modification you glycosylate the proteins um, in, in, in the ER, and that glycosylation pattern changes depending on what compartment you're in. So if, if you want to make a secreted protein, a secreted protein will have a slightly different glycosylation pattern than an ER resident protein. And if that's important to what you're doing, th then, then you should consider keeping the protein where it needs to be.